Ever wanted to be someone else? Ever wanted to be in a relationship because you needed to be? One of my favorite songs is Clichés of the World, B-Movie, by The Kinks. From the album State of Confusion, released in 1983, I'd recommend you listen, but the lyrics read, Sunset over the high rise by a motorway. A little man looks up at the sky, an uneventful end to a wasted day. Close up on the man at the window, looking at the street down below, it's obvious he's got things on his mind, he shakes his head, pulls down the blind. He starts writing a letter to make it perfectly clear. He's just a man who's reached the end of his rope, expressing his doubts and his fears. In a world feels so lonely and afraid, disillusioned by the promises they made, it's a pity that it ended up this way. Life is just a cliche. The kinks are noted for capturing the mundanity and disillusionment of the everyday man. And this image of the little man in this song specifically is one we've seen in film before. He's the guy we see ourselves in, inhabiting an alienation we know well, as we ourselves look out the window and fantasize about the ways our lives could be better. But what if this little man who wants more is actually a pathetic freak who deserves nothing but his continued suffering? What if this little man is a manipulative hypocrite, one who only cheats the system for his own survival? And what of the little woman? No, not those little women. What of the sad and dreary woman? The image of the pathetic woman was somebody without a man, without children, and with cats. Her loneliness was much less indicative of a greater existential struggle and more of an individual failure. In the same album by the Kinks, they do offer observations on the little woman, but more frequently from an outsider perspective, and also often in relation to the men in her life. For example, the song Come Dancing spotlights a similar feeling of alienation. They sing from the perspective of a younger sibling talking about their big sister, who goes out at night to dance with the boys at the Palais, until one day when she's older, it's knocked down for a bowling alley, then a supermarket, and now a parking lot. The lyrics say, The day they knocked down the Palais, my sister stood and cried. The day they knocked down the Palais, part of my childhood died just died. Now I'm grown up and playing in a band, and there's a car park where the Palais used to stand. My sister's married and she lives on an estate. Her daughters go out now, it's her turn to wait. She knows they get away with things she never could, but if I asked her, I wonder if she would. Come dancing. Come on, sister, have yourself a ball. Don't be afraid to come dancing. It's only natural. It's not quite the same pathetically sad tone used in cliches of the world. And it's more sympathetic as a woman is reminded of her own mortality and the evanescent nature of her past. It was also the most successful song of the album. Applying this lens to cinema, what if that big sister underwent a gender and sexual transformation and found love in another woman? Or what if the big sister was punished for loving someone so much? Greetings and salutations friends, my name is Ariana or Soda or Pop, depending on your geographical location. I first started a series called Lovable Double Features on this channel about three years ago with a video about Palm Springs and seeking a friend for the end of the world. The series essentially takes a look at two films that I feel are made in the same vein, not solely because of genre, but because of how they approach the subjects of romance and womanhood. The second video I made was about Moonstruck and Peggy Sue got married. And now I'm back for the third installment and actually a possible formal name for this series or program called Heart to Heart, Lovable Double Features. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about being John Malkovich and The Lobster. This essentially is just me talking about my favorite romance movies. Oops, spoilers for both films ahead. Being John Malkovich was written by Charlie Kaufman, who would later pen Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and was directed by Spike Jones, who wrote and directed Her. The film was released in 1999, and that just makes perfect sense because that is one of the greatest years in film history, and that's exactly where Being John Malkovich belongs. The film is about a failing puppeteer named Craig, played by John Cusack. His wife, Lottie, played by Cameron Diaz, encourages him to find work as she runs a pet store and is passionate about her work, even bringing it home with her. Finally, Craig becomes a filing clerk at a strange company located on floor seven and a half, aptly named for its low hanging ceilings. During his orientation, he is quickly enamored of Maxine, because who wouldn't be? It's Catherine fucking Keener, indie queen for the ages. Maxine does not reciprocate Craig's feelings, so when Craig finds a mysterious portal behind a filing cabinet that leads you to spend 15 minutes in the body of actor John Malkovich, he eagerly shares it with Maxine, who sees a potential for profit here. He also shares a discovery with Lottie, who needs to see it in order to believe it. And when she does, she undergoes a reckoning of gender and sexuality, and the film becomes a troubled love triangle in which everyone wants a piece of the Johnny Pie. 
The Lobster would not be released until 16 years later, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos and co-written with Ephithemus Philippou. Set in a dystopian but recognizable society, anyone without a legally declared romantic companion will be turned into an animal. When David, played by Colin Farrell, finds his marriage abruptly ended when his wife decides to leave him for another man, he checks into a hotel in which everyone is given 45 days to find a lover. However, not everyone subscribes to this reality, and just beyond the woods are the loners, rebels who disavow companionship. With only a week left, David fabricates a persona to attract the heartless woman, and though they begin a courtship, it's a ruse he cannot keep up with when she tests him by killing his dog, who was actually his brother. At the threat of being turned into an animal, David escapes to the woods and is welcomed by the loners, but they too have a systemic order set in place. Absolutely no flirting or sex with other loners. No problem. That is until another loner, the short-sighted woman, played by Rachel Weisz, catches David's four eyes, and the two begin a secret affair. This video is gonna be answering the questions of how do these morally ambiguous people navigate romance amidst the surreal and the absurd that envelops them. Though we may not actually be familiar with these alternate realities, what relational cognizance is to be found? As you can tell by my appearance, Lottie is one of my favorite characters to ever grace the screen. Whether or not I can stay like this while the AC is off is unclear. Cameron Diaz is just immaculate here in her range and her journey as the character of Lottie. When we first meet Lottie, she is immediately introduced to be a caretaker. Birds, monkeys, iguanas, chimps, all of them share the space with Lottie and Craig, who, as much as he may argue, finds support in Lottie as she is the household breadwinner and still manages to be soft-spoken and politely request more from her pathetic husband. She cleans up the wounds of her animals and Craig, whose risque puppetry doesn't do well in public spaces and leads to his being assaulted. Despite it all, Lottie sees a future with Craig, even asking him when they can resume discussions on having a child. This is the ultimate form of care, an offspring and having a family with the one that you love. Using his failure as an excuse, he says they should wait until they have some stable income. Lottie is routinely on hold. She is the little woman alongside Craig's little man whose quiet suffering isn't prioritized by Craig, but slowly bubbles to the surface. Lottie is the true heart of being John Malkovich, which is interesting considering she wasn't actually nominated for an Oscar for this role, but Katherine Keener as Maxine was. I think what is so fascinating about Lottie is that one, she is so similar to Craig, but two, she ultimately diverges to become a much better example of how to cope and overcome one's own dissatisfaction with life and remain open to change and rebirth. She does, however, wield a loaded gun and try to shoot Maxine, but you know, we'll get to that. No one's perfect. Being John Malkovich is often described as a surrealist film because when we think of surreal, we think of melting clocks aka Dali is the persistence of memory. And that is what being John Malkovich is about. This petulant beast surrounding identity and legacy, aging and what we accomplish and who we will accomplish that alongside. We are watching people walk into a portal to be in the mind of an existing actor for the sake of longevity. But philosophically, what is surrealism? What role does it play in the lives of these characters? How does it shape how they interact and lust after each other in ways with different outcomes? Let's get philosophical. Surrealism began as an artistic movement meant to defy reason, in which the conscious shakes hands with the unconscious to explore a more fantastical reality. Writer André Breton, like, is that annoying if I do it the whole time? I don't want to say André Breton, like, that just feels rude. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. Writer André Breton is considered one of the founders of the Surrealist movement, spearheading much of the structure of Surrealism as a thought process ripe for artistic exploration, as well as what he described the irrationality of love. Breton believed loving through Surrealism mandated an optimism and a hope for connection, a melioritative instinct of the movement. Breton was constantly weaving affection and desire for another with independent creativity and thought. It was a personal journey, but one best manifested through our interaction with the world. In 1937, Breton wrote Mad Love about his relationship with the artist Jacqueline Lamba, and it's surreal in how it includes photography, poetry, and even letters alongside this autobiographical prose. I want to highlight what Marianne Cause says in her introduction of the novel. Mad Love is not to be separated into two parts, with the madness split from the love. 
for the intertwining of the former with the latter is what makes the latter distinct. Cause says that mad love resurrects at once the sense of its high and grand insanity and the sense of its redemptive of all the rest, of all the frittered days and things of ordinary life. For Craig and eventually Lottie, their budding love for Maxine through Malkovich is maddening, insane, and helps lift them from their little states of being in order to achieve greatness for Craig through his art and for Lottie through her sexuality. And so I read through Mad Love to see not only how a surrealist but the surrealist describes that desire within humanity from a personal perspective. What I liked most about Mad Love was how quickly Breton identifies the impulses Craig and Lottie experience in being John Malkovich. He begins by talking about a dream he has in which about nine women sit in a row. Then a man comes into the room and sees the women, recognizing them as all his past and future lovers. How dark it is, Breton writes. He then continues, It's because I'm absolutely forbidden to imagine, in such a case, the behavior of any man at all, as long as he is a coward, this man in whose place I have so often been, that I can't think of anything more pathetic. He scarcely is at all this living man who would hoist himself up on this treacherous trapeze of time. This is very in line with the Craig that we come to know and hate, as the film continues. When Craig first finds the portal in Malkovich, he is not sure what to make of it or even what to do with it. So what does he do? He goes to Maxine. Obviously, Craig understands the existentialism of it all, but he questions this experience without seeing it as a kind of opportunity. That's when Maxine suggests they capitalize on it and create a business, charging people for some time in the portal. Craig doesn't love the idea at first, but he loves Maxine, so he gets over his hesitation. Interestingly enough, he tells Lottie about the portal. I find his decision to tell Lottie about the portal really fascinating because I wonder why he lets his partner in so intimately. Maybe he worries he can't whip up a strong enough lie for why he will be working with this partner at such odd hours of the night and it's just easier to tell the truth. Or maybe it's for his ego to share this incredible thing that he discovered and get due credit from the woman who sees him at his most vulnerable. Craig even encourages Lottie to try the portal out for herself, thus provoking his own undoing. Craig not only becomes eclipsed by Maxine's business to allow others to try the portal, thus not really entering it himself anymore, but by his wife, who will come to use the portal to bond with Maxine, thus awakening his jealousy so intensely, he will decide to exploit Lottie's actions and success for himself, going into Malkovich pretending to be Lottie just to seduce Maxine. Craig realizes what he wants to do with Malkovich is to become desirable to Maxine. This is the first instinct he wants to serve. Craig is defined by the women around him who are more readily able to achieve what they want and desire. Then, it's only once he realizes just how much control he can have over Malkovich that his creative instinct kicks in and he sees how it can be in service of his puppetry. Craig's sexual ineptitude is interconnected with his inability to be creatively successful. And thus, Craig in his entirety, as said by Breton, scarcely is, and remains weakly bound to the women around him, which is fitting, considering he will end the film trapped inside the brain of Maxine and Lottie's daughter, rendered completely absent and powerless. How dark it is, indeed. In Mad Love, Breton tries to understand why he feels so drawn to this spoon, ultimately concluding it's a phallic symbol for him. Just run with it, hold on, give me a second. He begins to think about the fairy tale Cinderella, saying that her slipper takes on the meaning of the lost object. I can easily understand that it symbolized for me a woman, unique and unknown, magnified and dramatized by my loneliness and my imperious need to abolish certain memories. Sound familiar? But it isn't just Craig who views Maxine as unique and unknown, as a vessel through which he can absolve his loneliness, assuming an arrogant authority over the need to possess her. But Lottie, who does this too, they are not that different from one another. When Lottie goes into the portal, it is out of curiosity. There are no ulterior goals or motives. The moment she is John, Something stirs inside of her. She comes out of the shower and says, I feel sexy, which we can understand by the way she looks and carries herself and the way her husband treats her is not a feeling she has identified with in a long time. And it isn't that I don't personally find Maxine attractive, but when you think of sexy and you have a character that carries herself like Maxine, 
No, Lottie is not meant to inhabit that same level of sexuality. But all of these new feelings surrounding her gender identity precede her sexuality, not in terms of how she feels, but in how she is attracted to others. All of this happens before Maxine calls John Malkovich. Being John Malkovich won the Glad Media Award for Outstanding Film, and I know that the way it presents queerness may not be perfect, and I think that Lottie's journey does feel unfinished in a way, but I'll get to that a little bit later. This exploration of Lottie's nascency is one of the most touching for me personally, because I see my journey reflected in Lottie. Like her, the early stages of my own gender dysphoria originated from this feeling of undesirability, of not feeling able to access what feminine sexuality meant because I didn't look a certain way, and the ways in which I did reflect stereotypical feminine sexuality I didn't like. These guys. So the idea that inhabiting a man, an actor who is sensitive and masculine but not in a dramatic way, feels right for Lottie. She has temporarily escaped her flesh prison and realizes, oh, feeling sexy can look like different things. It can even look like masculinity. It can feel like manhood. Essentially, it can be everything she's never had access to before, everything that's been repressed. This is a portal to freedom for Lottie, even if it's somebody else's restraint. So in the midst of this gender euphoria, Maxine calls Malkovich. Now, a woman is actively desiring Lottie, who is titillated by a strange woman's voice. She doesn't know that it's Maxine on the other call. But again, by inhabiting a male body, Lottie is able to open a rainbow-colored door she never even knew existed to explore a relationship more fluid than the ones she has previously known. Lottie is so curious, in fact, she sort of wills Malkovich to go see that woman tonight that woman that is Maxine. And in the car on the way to Dr. Lester's house, who is Craig's boss, Lottie articulates a new profound sense of identity and certainty to Craig. I knew who I was, she says. All of her insecurities, her failures, and her burdens were lifted for a moment. And then sexuality took a hold. She needs to go back there when Malkovich goes to have dinner with this woman. When she sees Maxine walk through the door, she is surprised and aroused and likes how this queer intimacy feels because she is still a woman inside of this man after all. The next day, Lottie arrives to Craig's office and tells him that she has not been able to shake off the intensity of the gender euphoria that she experienced. For the first time, everything just felt right, she says. She thinks she may be transsexual, which is the word that she uses, and wants to go see her doctor about it. Now, this is played for laughs when Craig gives her shit and is like, what is your allergist gonna do about your gender dysfunction? Personally, I, I would do that too, I don't know. I have allergies and I'm gay, I don't know. But the language that Lottie uses here resonates. Sure, the film is sort of inflating gender and sexuality, as Lottie ultimately, as far as we know, stays a woman. But I feel like one queer reading of this is that Lottie has grown up thinking that men are with women and women must have a certain way to please and support their man. So her first instinct to find release and freedom from that repression is to be a man because that was what she was in Malkovich. But I think what she ultimately learns is that by exploring her attraction to women, something she never saw possible, she is able to find that freedom by reclaiming her sexuality. Through recontextualizing her own desire and worth by being desired, Lottie finds a solution to her own dissatisfaction and loneliness. Could this journey have been better articulated so that it wasn't like being gay equals not being trans? Absolutely, but I don't think the gender stuff feeling unfinished means it's without value. And I especially love that after Maxine hears Lottie's confession about being trans, she immediately switches to he, him pronouns. I don't know, I lie. So now Lottie knows she's into Maxine. So Lottie's like, let's invite Maxine over for dinner. And Craig doesn't want to do that. So Lottie says one of my favorite lines ever in the movie, which is, I'll cook a lasagna, we'll smoke a joint, tensions will melt away. Both Craig and Lottie lust after Maxine in funny and overbearing ways. A perfect wide shot ready to showcase their embarrassing lunge toward Maxine, who sits between them on the couch. But here, in the depiction of their desires, we learn how Lottie is not exactly like Craig. For the site, the film experience, Claudio Alves writes, Far from playing Lottie's obsession and romantic epiphany for laughs, Diaz drains her portrait of any irony. 
The actress performs it all with the sincerity and the seriousness of a born tragedian. Even her more endearingly goofy moments, like the nervous flirting she does during a dinner with Maxine and Craig, come off as reflections of the character's inner turmoil. During that dinner, she is fidgety, constantly touching her hair and fixing her expression, trying to call attention to herself, but hide her body at the same time. And that, to me, is very gender. Maxine sees this earnestness in Lottie, one that does not exist in Craig. Maxine reels from both their affections, turns and tells Craig she is wholeheartedly not attracted to him. But she turns to Lottie and says in Malkovich she could sense her feminine longing, but that still she only wants Lottie when she's in Malkovich. It's frustrating that this queerness is being barred by the comfort and ease of heterosexuality, but sometimes that's real life, and it does eventually become a gateway to a shared sapphic understanding. Both women want to see each other again through Malkovich, if it means less shame, less embarrassment, more protection against something new for both of them. The next time they do, they have sex, which leads to one of the most heartwarming shots in not a very heartwarming film, which is that of Lottie's official awakening. Once her time in the portal is up for that night, she is dumped onto the side of the highway as is protocol, but it is not embarrassing or awkward. It is beautiful. She has been cathartically and sexually renewed, albeit to Craig's rejected dismay. In Surrealism and Cinema, I bet you thought we were done with that. Mm -mm, no, that's most of this video. By Michael Richardson, he says, surrealism is always about departures rather than arrivals. In Being John Malkovich, the characters detach themselves, flee from their caged, repressed selves, and the most surreal character, Craig, who completely abandons his own identity to control Malkovich, never feels like he necessarily arrives at anything new. Craig does not grow. He does not change. He is pathetic through and through. And while he does find success in his puppetry, that is a materialist goal he ultimately loses, and his other material goal, to be with Maxine, quickly fizzles out and also ends with him alone. Richardson, of course, has to reference director Luis Buñuel, the Spanish filmmaker who heavily worked within surrealist spaces. This iconic image is from his 1929 short film, Un Chien Andalou, or An Andalusian Dog. Richardson dives deeper into a film Buñuel made a year later, Age of Gold, another surrealist exploration, this time about a couple trying to be together amidst a judgmental society. He refers to other writers, including Linda Williams, who he says offers the best summary of the film's theme, which is that Age of Gold is a questioning of society and of the illusory unity of the social body, once more through the disruptive force of erotic desire. Richardson goes on to say, as the accompanying surrealist manifesto has it, the film brings us the gift of violence. The lead characters struggle to overcome the obstacles placed in the way of the realization of their love. Yet at the same time, Peter Kral points out, the film is less about love and desire as about their frustration and the obstacles they encounter. And this frustration is not simply social, it is also contained within the lovers themselves. There is more to this quote, but I'll revisit that later. This description of the romance between the characters in Age of Gold bears a likeness to what we see going on between Lottie, Craig, and Maxine, and the lovers that I'll tackle later in The Lobster. I would argue that being John Malkovich and The Lobster are a lot more violent than they are sexual, about the frustrations of attempting to realize love than they are about actually relishing in the joys of love once realized. When he finds Maxine, Craig thinks that this is someone he can latch onto not just sexually, but creatively, as she eventually does support his puppeteering as a way for profit because that's really all she cares about. What Craig fails to understand when Maxine is attracted to Lottie is that he is not a symbol of profound, devoted, though unrealized love, a victim of a society who doesn't appreciate him, but instead, as Maxine puts it, the face of love in the unrequited variety. In fact, Unrequited sexual desire is at the center of the portal in terms of Dr. Lester, who is the main bitch in charge of what this portal is actually meant for. Old people who don't want to die because they want to fuck. When at the end of the film, Dr. Lester is finally able to inhabit Malkovich, we see that he succeeds in seducing his secretary, Floris, whom earlier he said would never want him because of his age, when he really wants his body to inspire lust in that beautiful, complex woman. Dr. Lester invites Craig out after saying this and says, I am the love god Eros. Eros is the symbol of romantic love, but another form of love is mania, 
which is unbalanced eros and a lack of healthy panoplia, which is self-love. And this is what Craig feels, to the point that when Dr. Lester calls to say he has kidnapped Maxine and will kill her if Craig doesn't leave Malkovich's body, Craig hesitates. This love triangle exhibits the gift of violence that Richardson spoke of, because when Lottie tells Maxine that Craig has tied her up and forced Lottie to lie and say she was in Malkovich, and thus Maxine has been sleeping with Craig through Malkovich, Maxine doesn't choose Lottie. But her reasoning for doing so is not solely sexual. When Lottie reveals that Craig has learned how to fully take over John's body, Maxine says, so if Craig can control Malkovich, and I can control Craig. For Maxine, love is incidental in the game of profit, power, and coming out on top. Craig and Lottie have to overcome the obstacle of not being fully desired by Maxine. And Maxine has to overcome the obstacle of her selfishness. Maxine decides to stay with Craig and Malkovich and acts as his manager. But soon the glow of this power she once happily wielded against him fades. And now she sits with this loneliness. This is a loneliness that Lottie once felt and was forced to feel again. When Maxine gets kidnapped by Dr. Lester and Lottie as they're working together to get Craig out of Malkovich, Lottie is furious and pulls a gun on Maxine, chasing after her with the classic line we hear from cinematic men, if I can't have you, no one can. Maxine runs into Malkovich's portal to escape, with Lottie hot on her trail, shouting and shooting at her. And yes, if we take this literally, it's hashtag toxic, they are totally not endgame, but I think coming from Lottie, who was so quiet and willing to be things for other people when no one was willing to be things and bend for her, I think that she's righteously angry. And though it may be jarring, it's exciting to see her burst and remind us that she is somewhat like Craig. She feels that possession. But it comes from a place of actual abandonment by Maxine and not a pathetic rejection like Craig. Maxine is not innocent. She has been a spearheader of all of this madness and actively hurt Lottie, whom she had feelings for and now realizes that. Yeah, it's not cool to shoot the pregnant person you love, but everyone in this movie is kind of a dick, so I don't think it's that problematic that this is an element of the queer storyline. Once they leave the portal, they have a serious conversation. Maxine proclaims to love Lottie and Lottie says, you are so full of shit, to which Maxine says, I know, and even quieter repeats, I know. Maxine finally has her own transformation, trying to shed her selfishness, especially now that she is with child. And she reveals that Lottie is the father, mother, whatever, which I think is a cool line and blends this gender identity back into Lottie's sexuality. The two of them make up and decide to start their lives together, right as an exasperated Craig comes out of the portal saying he's left it all behind for Maxine idiot behavior. They get in their taxi and drive away, and a stubborn Craig returns to the portal too late, as Malkovich is now closed. And so Craig is stuck in the next vessel, which is Lottie and Maxine's daughter, leaving Craig doomed to witness their happiness, but unable to control the body because it was an unaged vessel and portal. In true Breton optimistic fashion, the lovers find their happy ending, the family that Lottie always wanted, and the man who refused to grow scarcely is. I think it's funny how for both films, I don't have to try too hard to transform my appearance because I too have frizzy hair and can't see far away. Context. Honestly, unlike my other videos in this series, and even when I was talking about being John Malkovich, I really struggled to begin my analysis of the lobster with the short-sighted woman. Despite not seeing her face or knowing who she is until an hour into the movie, she is our narrator. Her voice is clinical, detached, a deadpan perspective over David's journey. Later, it is revealed that the leader of the loners and her confidant, the maid, have found the short-sighted woman's journal, their discovery being the reason for the narration and now they know all of the secrets of her and David's affair. But the short-sighted woman is sort of sidelined in this story. Of course, her romance with David isn't without its beauty, but at first glance, she is not given much more than all of the other characters in the film. David is independently situated, being the only one to have a name. We even know what he does for a living. He's an architect. Without a distinct name, career, or backstory, the short-sighted woman who we will call S because it's too many words, is not much different from the ensemble. 
only in her loving rebellion for which she is punished. As a new member of the loners, David is in the woods when one of his former hotel guests finds him and is about to shoot David with a tranquilizer dart. But S shows up and saves David. They begin talking more and one day, David, who wears glasses, learns that she wears contacts. In this society, in order to properly identify and affirm your match, you need to both have a main characteristic in common. For another guest played by Ben Wishaw, he fakes having nosebleeds so that he can be paired with the woman who is played by Jessica Barden with, who has chronic nosebleeds. When David pretends to be a cold, careless man to be with the heartless woman, but fails to upkeep this image, he inadvertently becomes a rebel, but not because he actually possesses or describes an unhappiness with the way that things are. So when he meets this beautiful woman and she has bad eyesight too, those previous desires for connection and stability needed to re-enter the world arise and they jeopardize their safety to be with each other. Earlier in the video, I shared a quote when discussing being John Malkovich about the gift of violence these films feature that I said I would share the second half of later. This is later. And this frustration is not simply social. It is also contained within the lovers themselves. Love, indeed, is even revealed through separation if one accepts the proposition of the Surrealist Manifesto. These characters do not represent the exemplary Surrealist couple. As febrile as their love is, it is also as if detached from them, passionately drawn to one another to an extent that causes them to tear at the restraints society places on love, they are still only able to relate beyond one another. The tragedy for the man and the woman is that as much as they tear at the immediate restraints of society, it is their own Oedipal subjugation they are really fighting, which they appear unable to even begin to confront. Now, I'm, I'm not tackling Freud here, I'm sorry. But this quote is good at illustrating how David and the short-sighted woman fail, in a sense. As much as they initially appear to be rebels of both societies, that of forced companionship and that of the loners, they are somewhat tragic and can only find passion insofar as they are able to relate beyond each other and define their relationship through the gaze of their society. The thing is, The Lobster is not technically a surreal film. It's often classified as an absurd one. And those words are sometimes used interchangeably. Taylor J. Williams made a video a couple months ago about poor things, made by the same director, Yorgos Lanthimos, and whether or not he is actually a surrealist filmmaker. The film The Lobster is not philosophically or stylistically surreal. It is actually fairly grounded. So though David and S are not a definitive surrealist couple, they do encounter the shortcomings of one. In that final scene at the restaurant, before David goes to the bathroom, the lovers are initially not captured in a single shot, divided by the frame and the looming question of whether or not David will make the sacrifice required to commit. That is, until he asks her to smile. And a wide shot shows a small smile appear on his face as he thinks about this woman who he may not see with his own eyes ever again. He is attracted to her, but is attraction and love worth the sacrifice? When I mentioned this quote in the Being John Malkovich section, I also said that these films are more violent than they are sexual. In Being John Malkovich, we never see anyone in the core three have sex except Maxine. We don't see Lottie and Maxine have sex once they are officially together. Maxine never even really kisses Craig. And in The Lobster, children are not the result of passionate, unprotected sex, but seemingly pop up from thin air as gifts to remedy a couple's problems. The hotel guests don't masturbate, they are simply edged by the maid. And most importantly, we don't see our main lovers have sex at all. They talk about it candidly. S uses the word fuck when narrating about how they communicate through body language and what they do in secret. This is an interesting narrative choice because we do see David have sex with the heartless woman. And contrary to anti-sex in film rhetoric, it does have a narrative purpose in that the heartless woman is beginning to grow suspicious of David and wants to see if he is actively deriving pleasure from their sex. So then why do we never see David and S have sex or be any more intimate than a steamy couch session? We see that a man and woman have had their lips cut off, subject to the red kiss for their flirting. But S says the punishment she is most afraid of is the red intercourse, which we can infer would entail both parties having their genitals cut off. Yet, despite doing the dirty and thus qualifying for that punishment, that is not what the loner leader decides to do with S. She instead has her blinded. In Taylor's video, he notes how Lanthimos uses a 
go-to lens of sex for examining human relationships and power dynamics and puts his characters in these experiments that consist largely of sexual reward and punishment. That the lobster does show the rewards and punishment without the sex is surprising considering how explicit Lanthimos' film Dogtooth was and how prevalent sex would be in his later film. So the question is, why is there not sex between the two lovers? The cynic in me wants to say that it's to further create a distance between us and the characters that we think are meant to represent hope and optimism. Richard Brody heavily shits on the lobster in his review for The New Yorker. Lanthimos' lacrimose lament for a world centered on couples and a subworld centered on solitaires betrays a cranky, dyspeptic sense of sexual and romantic dysphoria. Not a lament for the state of society or of the human condition, but an airing of his own petty complaints. The infinitesimally mild satire of the hotel's blandly and dogmatically romantic pop culture is matched by the movie's ultimate benediction of, surprise, surprise, the redemptive power of true love. It's a self-satisfied film about an issue that's not an issue, depicting a dystopia that's utterly apolitical. When I first saw The Lobster, I did like the way it depicted this deadpan romance. That's kind of my bag, baby. But this time watching it, I honestly felt more jaded to it. And the main reason for that was David. This is where I will begin to present you with two subjective analyses of The Lobster. One more cynical and the other more compassionate. Beginning with the former, I am tempted to not read the film as a benediction of the redemptive power of true love. I don't really see David as a great lover. I see him as a selfish one. I see David as I see Craig. Both Craig and David exist as the unchosen man and manipulate their identity and that of others to fulfill themselves. When David asks the loner leader to be the one to go visit the nosebleeding couple and disrupt their relationship, I don't believe it comes from a place of wanting to care for the nosebleed girl and the illusion that's been presented to her. I think it comes from a place of superiority in which David can point to this rebellion and say, look at me, I'm not a desperate liar like you even though he was with the heartless woman. David similarly spins his desire into the other side of the spectrum, overcompensating and willing to dive so deep into the necessity of a shared characteristic that is no longer a lie, but a forced truth. Maybe the romantic can say, look at David, willing to blind himself to be with the one that he loves, but he can be with the one that he loves somewhere else. David craves the stability of living in the society that he knows and is willing to radically manipulate his identity through his eyesight rather than be with S on his own terms because he doesn't have any terms of his own. Through this reading, this was never about being different and embracing it, but being different until you finally found someone you are similar to. And this intense need to be a part of society with his lover compels David to hold a knife to his eye at the film's end. Continuing to read under the more cynical lens, by not showing the sex between David and S, which should in theory be more sensual than the clinical depictions of intercourse and quasi-masturbation shown before it, we cannot totally ascribe to the intimacy we think the lovers share. The closest we get is when the couple are in the city with the loner leader and her fake husband, and David and S have a little too much fun pretending and commence a steamy makeout session on the couch, moved by the music the leader's parents are playing. Don't get me wrong, the couch scene is good. Their intensity is visceral and arousing. Alice Haitlip Bryan says that this scene is a rare one in the Lanthimos film. Their embrace is slightly awkward. Their bodies turned into one another as they sit side by side on a chair. Hands fumble about in laps. Her hair is frizzy, his glasses steamed up. If one were to ignore the setting and the man sitting next to them, their affection would appear quite lifelike. A sexual realism that is neither pretty nor perfect, but natural. Therefore, this sequence provides an interesting contribution to the study of sexual behavior in Lanthimos' films, as it is a rare example of a mutually enjoyable and loving embrace of equals, where no transaction is taking place and each participant responds to and gives the other pleasure. But this scene occurs at a point in the film when they still have something in common. And as the relationship scales are tested and thus left unbalanced by their stark force difference, it allows David to assume a more powerful and decisive role in the relationship. 
I'm not trying to say that sex is necessary in order for us to root for a couple. But when we know that the last time David had sex was a facade, I as a viewer am curious to see if he plays any other performative role in his sex with S. After S is blinded, they play a game of touch guess, think win. And David lies to S about how successful her guesses are. He asks if he can give her a kiss and she says, we can't do that anymore. So clearly there is a level of desire on his part, but is it possibly a desperate attempt to grasp what they once had that's now being blocked by societal limitation? This scene is what prompts David to think of his plan to escape and blind himself. David is willing to ascribe to another societal limitation, except this one gives him the opportunity for what he wants, sex, companionship someone to rub ointment on his back. So if David and the short-sighted woman do not share a surreal love, how was their relationship in the context of the film's style absurd? In Movies with Meaning, Dan Shaw refers to Albert Camus, the philosopher and founder of absurdism, in his analysis of leaving Las Vegas. Shaw quotes Camus and says, the denseness and strangeness of the world is the absurd, grounded in our awareness of the brevity of life, the inevitability of death, the silence of the universe and the absence of God, and the prospect of nothingness. Absurdism is what can so easily envelop the little man when the social frameworks meant to exhibit our value fail him. Like when Craig puts all his value in his puppeteering and then can't find success. This conflict of our meaning and purpose with our reality gives birth to absurdism. And one major conflict that most readily gives birth to absurdism is of course death and our helpless march toward it. We may want to continue to live, but we know we can't, and thus the conflict breeds absurdism. In 2021, Paul G. Naiman sought to conceptualize Camus' attitudes toward love, noting how none of his finished work actively reckoned with the notion to form a philosophy of love. Camus offers several ways to cope with this absurd reality. One, suicide, which he is ultimately against. Two, a leap of faith, which is a tad too naive and optimistic. And three, revolt, which was the most favored option because it emphasized reckoning over escapism. Camus viewed embracing the absurd as an act of radical existence. So when it comes to crystallizing absurd love, it involves the tension of wanting this love to last, but knowing it cannot, either because of death or just human folly. I think what initially bothered me about S was the question of why she has this diary. She is the reason that her and David get caught. Granted, they had lax on being careful, but to put all of her misdeeds in writing for them to discover, which in and of itself is a common and frustrating trope, is frustrating, but I think I get it now. Of course, a degree of isolation can be inferred. Everybody is alone. It's natural to wanna to get those feelings out somehow. But at first, it just feels like a thrown in narrative coincidence as a way to reveal their affair. Then when it is revealed, she is the one who receives the brunt of the punishment when the leader decides to have her blinded, which makes sense because the leader has known her for longer and maybe felt more betrayed and expected more loyalty from S than she did from David. I think what it is and what transitions us to the second perspective of a more compassionate view of David and S's love is that there is a level of sincerity in their relationship. Though again, I think most of that sincerity comes from S. As frustrating as it is, her diary is an outward expression of this sincerity, like that of a little girl running to talk about her crush in the safe space of secret prose. Not my thermos being in the frame, god damn it. Another example of the short-sighted woman's sincerity in her feelings is through her narration of the first time she sees David. Sure, at this point, she knows that they share their short-sightedness, but she presents that fact through David's perspective after acknowledging her own attraction to him. She says, he seemed quite presentable. The next day in the city, he found out that I was short-sighted too. This doesn't exactly come across as a reason for her own attraction, a socially recognized reason to lust after him, but instead one for David. After this, she says that she dreams that they have sex, but are brutally attacked, foreshadowing their obstacles and the way it's interwoven with their desire. It's only after David learns about their similarity that he shares a more overt interest in S. The first scene back in the forest after their trip into the city, when he learns, begins with him saying, when did you become short-sighted? 
I don't even know the answer to that, like maybe third grade, I guess. S herself is the one to bring the conversation into a genuine territory by offering to rub ointment on David's back. And I think we are meant to favor her sincerity and generosity over whatever David is up to. Because when she asks this, the camera stays steady on her and her kind eyes, the backside and profile of David on the edge of the frame. When they discover S's journal, it says, we love each other and we suit each other. And that's the reason why we've decided to leave the woods and stay together forever in the city. The diary entry ends with her fantasizing about what they will do together in the city. S seems to ignore the absurd and instead falls to the impulse of imagining forever and not considering the end of her and David's relationship. In that way, similarly to Craig, David inhabits the absurd a bit more than the short-sighted woman. David does try to resist the frameworks of a socially recognized love, and his and S's idea to escape and return to the world seems to be coming from a genuine place of wanting to be able to be together, with love coming first and the society that allows it coming second, rather than it being forced upon them. So if David revolts this society that forces him to find a mate by fleeing to join the loners, and then also comes to revolt the loners by finding love in the short-sighted woman, the real question of whether their coupling as a whole is absurd is found in the final moments once they decide to escape the loners by rejoining the original society of their own accord. David and S's revolt is in a state of flux, but where does that revolt ultimately cement itself? By presumably and perhaps deciding to blind himself, is David really a rebel anymore or determined to reinstitute himself as a cog in the soulmate machine? Neiman writes that the absurd person is, as Camus says, a rebel who says no, but whose refusal does not imply a renunciation. One can refuse or resist the frameworks that assure one that love is permanent and socially recognized, but one cannot renounce the existence of the desire for love to have these traits. Maintaining awareness of absurdity requires holding on to both the desires that love imparts and the reality that their satisfaction is uncertain. After S is blinded, their plan and entire relationship is put on pause because now they don't have that similar something which they can use to blend into society. In that way, David is unable to fully renounce the society of shared traits because it is the only way in which he and S can be together in some normal way. David still desires their love to have the traits which make them socially recognizable. But Neiman also says that the person in revolt, the rebel, instead attempts to live with reality as it actually is. To live without appeal means to live without appealing to a framework that provides comfort and familiarity at the expense of an honest account of one's present experience. This is where David falters, in that he at least considers choosing to appeal to that framework that would give him an S stability and romantic freedom at the expense of his experience as a short-sighted person. Through this lens, the only way in which David can remain absurd in his relationship is not to blind himself, but to find a way to be with S anyway, though we know that may not happen because they have no other specific traits in common, David asked. One can say that to blind himself is absurd in some way, maybe in the adjective sense of the word, because it would be disingenuous, not exactly playing into society's rules, but manipulating them, in the same way Ben Wishaw's character does with nosebleeds. And we do know David and S have some form of intimacy that other lovers in the film don't. Is this illusion once rendered real in that blindness, unlike nosebleeds, cannot be faked if it is to be successful, enough of a revolt to declare their relationship absurd? Neiman says that Camus argues absurdism, like methodical doubt, has wiped this slate clean. It leaves us in a blind alley, an experience of the absurdity of love if it is confronted rather than eluded can similarly wipe the slate clean of social and cultural norms that fail to recognize the reality of people's lived experiences of love. David and S desperately attempt to hold on to their lived experience of love while still understanding that the social and cultural norms are what can provide them the future and supposed longevity of their love. David and S understand the reality of their love can only thrive insofar as they are willing to manipulate what makes it safe, 
wiping their slate clean and confronting their absurdity, but abandoning its revolt and pivoting toward a blind leap of faith. I also think a queer lens assists in supporting this compassionate view of David and S. Obviously the film is not as overt in its queerness as being John Malkovich, but when it won the jury prize at COD, it also received a special mention in the queer pawn category. In the film, when David arrives at the hotel, he asks if there is a bisexual option, as he was with a man in college and may be open to exploring that again. However, this is not floor seven and a half, and the hotel says he must choose. It is a binary world after all. David does think about this for a moment before ultimately choosing women. I personally suspect a level of queerness between the loner leader and the maid, who acts as the leader's man on the inside. The maid, who also helps David overcome the heartless woman, is married to a man she hates, talking about him to the loner leader, and saying she wants to leave the hotel and officially join the loners. The leader is very soft with the maid here, saying, you're terrific, you know that? And calling her brilliant, then hugging her. The maid seems surprised by this gesture. Juxtaposing how the camera captured the short-sighted woman's earnest linger, the shot stays on the maid's rigidness and accepting this thoughtful hug from the person who does not even let people dance together. The leader even tells the maid to keep taking her birth control, to protect herself from the man's sexuality. But alas, this is short-lived and bears resemblance to the violent stint in Lottie and Maxine's relationship as the loner leader forcibly uses the maid as a shield so the short-sighted woman kills her instead. Mario Saras connects the lack of sex in The Lobster to a queer textuality. And despite there being little, if any, sex shown on screen, sex looms everywhere as the structurally absent image that navigates not only the film's narrative, but also its polemic queer post-humanist rhetoric through alienating and deconstructing devices that expose its historical links to violence, abuse, and yes, power. Through this lens, not showing David and S have sex protects them from the judgment that comes from the audience and the power dynamics that we attribute to intercourse, further queering their relationship in the scheme of both societies and potentially uplifting it as something more rooted in sentimentality and, well, love. Out reported that jury chair and director Desiree Akavan selected The Lobster as a special mention despite its lack of gay material because the themes in the film selected for this category stretch to anything that goes against the mainstream. I think that as awkwardly charming and romantic both final couples Lottie and Maxine and David and S are, there is a room for paranoia. And that's what I think lends itself best to readings of the surreal and absurd. For Lottie and Maxine, we can at least interpret some success, seeing as their daughter looks to be maybe six or seven. So they have longevity on their side. Not only that, but they seem very much in love. They hold each other, they joke and converse about their child, they seem happy. But their affair doesn't come without their share of baggage, as their daughter is now a vessel, a portal. For David and S, the ambiguous ending offers no resolution that they make it, and they are less physically affectionate now. The choice to root for or to be suspicious of their love is an absurd one. Up to us to decide. So obviously countless essays have been written about the use of animal motifs in Lanthimos' films, and it's nearly impossible to feel like I'm saying something original about that, but I will try my best. I just definitely recommend you check out other more thorough examinations of this, especially essays in the book that I've been quoting, which is The Cinema of Yorgos Lanthimos, Films, Form, Philosophy. For Lottie, caring for animals is, of course, from the goodness of her heart. But it's also a way in which the narrative can further wedge something between her and Craig. The animals are not only a projection of Lottie's domesticity, but her ambition, which emphasizes Craig's failure. After all, this is her work, and it dominates the home, which for an unemployed person is the main territory Craig resides in. The animals occupy so much of the space in the kitchen, living room, and even their bed, whereas Craig must retreat to his office to use his puppets in private because he's perverse. I think in examining the animal motif, two separate metaphors of animalism emerge. One which says that people are no better than animals, and another which says that animals are better than people. In Surrealism and Cinema, Richardson references the work of director Walerian Boroswick and his 1975 film Story of Sin, which he positions alongside Bunuel's The Age of Gold as a landmark exploration of the disruptive impact 
of love on social relation. Richardson says a mention should also be made of another important element we will find in many Broswick films, the role of animals, intermediaries between the world of matter and the world of the spirit. Animals often appear to be more intelligent than the humans. Elijah, the chimp, proves to be more compassionate to Lottie than her own husband. When Craig ties Lottie up and puts her in the cage so he can seduce Maxine as Malkovich. Craig literally has to dehumanize his own wife in order to gain any sort of power in the situation. Once again, finding strength in strings or ropes. Yet he is naive in thinking that he is reducing Lottie to being an animal, when the animal not only helps Lottie escape by untying her wrists, but heals his childhood trauma of failing to free his captured parents. This is something I don't think Craig will ever be equipped to do. That is, help himself heal by being generous rather than exploitative and self-obsessed. In Making Meaning, Shaw refers to philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer's perspective on pessimism, in which he understood man's desire for more is insatiable, thus leading to misery, which is what we see for Craig. Optimists claim that on balance there is more pleasure than pain in existence. As a test for that statement, Schopenhauer suggested that his readers should compare the respective feelings of two animals, one of which was engaged in eating the other. Through this lens, Craig himself is worse than an animal, a miserable man determined to make others suffer if he can't succeed. In The Lobster, the only thing she asks of David after she saves his life is to trap her some rabbits. They're her favorite food, and she narrates how exactly she likes them prepared. I've always been fascinated by food and film, and I really love that this animal, this meal, is how S first extends vulnerability. Sure, she'd like to be paid a thank you for what she's done. It's unlikely anyone else would have done that for him. And to request rabbits, this positive and gentle symbol of beginnings, positivity, and fertility, is erotic in some way. It's an intimate thing to hunt for a person, to make their meal. David has no experience doing this, and when he sees another man giving her rabbits, he grows jealous. David goes to S after seeing her laugh with this man and says she does not need to accept rabbits from other people, that he will do it for her. And he asks if the man who brought them to her is short-sighted. Now he has something personal with which he can possess in some way in order to keep him and S close. It's a relationship dynamic not yet based on sex or romantic fruition, but the idea of providing and being needed. In his video that I mentioned, Taylor J. Williams acknowledges how some are quick to assign this Schopenhauer lens to Lanthimos films, but he argues that Lanthimos' fascination with reducing people to animals inherently demonstrates a belief in the human spirit, something that separates us from animals and which can only be revealed by an attempt to box us in as such. But I'm willing to bet we're the only animals who draw larger epiphanies from the study and experience of sex, which is why it's become such a strong connective thematic tissue for Lanthimos. David refuses to become the lobster that he initially chose to become if needed, and it is through a love that at least on S's end begins with genuine attraction and is then informed by social labels that he can avoid this fate in at least a slightly more authentic way. So, what are we left with? I think what is so compelling about these love stories in Being John Malkovich and The Lobster is that they provoke us to either identify our homeless romantic side or our more cynical pessimistic side. Because the couples are flawed, Lottie and Maxine not necessarily being kind, and David and S not being the most normal couple, they are emblematic of deeper existential struggles within our interior lives, and they inform us on the different ways in which love, desire, and sex can be used to cope with the truth of our futility, the confusion of our identity, and the fear of being alive, but also the alternative to that. I found this funny snippet of an interview from Salon with writer Charlie Kaufman that I really want to read to you guys. Since his script is a grand joke on the eternal mind-body problem, I asked him if he meant the only heroic character to be Lottie's pet chimp, Elijah. But Kaufman saw through my gambit as one more case of a journalist trying to tie his creation to a theme. Is Elijah heroic? He seems to be rather heroic, but really, who knows what's going on inside him? We don't know what's going on inside of Elijah because he doesn't communicate like a human. But really, regardless, we don't even know what's going on with other people in our lives, the ones that we love, the humans around us, oftentimes even ourselves. And that is what makes love so absurd and surreal. It has the possibility to be the most authentic illusion of closeness. It is rooted in this awareness that we may get hurt. But the flip side of this reckoning with the fact that we can hurt these people and that the worst of ourselves 
can and will affect the ones we love. And that if we aren't careful, that love can easily become ownership and possession when we think that love is a capital R right for us, that we must have it in order to complete us. And that because of that, the one that you love owes you because you've each committed to completing each other and assuming the responsibility of being someone's other half. I chose the snares of love in reference to Michael Richardson's chapter, Luis Buñuel and the snares of desire to reflect this relationship of animalistic, feral love and the ways in which we become predators of affection and prey to naive beliefs of forever with the ones we love. Philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, because you know I had to say one more mighty man before I left, pioneered existentialism, and from that a romantic pessimism, or realism depending on your perspective, emerged, warning people of how monogamous love can be doomed to fail if it falls into certain traps. Sander Lee noted three reasons why love could fail. One, it's rooted in the false truth that we are not independent, but bound to something bigger than ourselves, a we. Two, the folly of being a partner riddled with insecurities and thus making a relationship more sensitive. And three, the monogamous lover's fear of an existential threat in a third party. The third reason is what dooms Craig and Lottie's love. And you could see Maxine as a third party, but it's honestly Malkovich that disrupts them. Craig, as Malkovich and Maxine, ultimately fail because of reason number two, because he is too insecure and must pretend to be someone else to have her, which just makes things fade because she was really only in it for material reasons and not love. And David and the short-sighted woman engage with reason number one. They need to believe that they are a profound we in order to function within this society. But that will lead to a sacrifice on David's end that we can only wonder whether or not it will affect them later, should this social fabric begin to tear. For Sartre, death does not have to be this noble thing we accept, but just an absurd reality we deal with. All of our characters attempt to rebuke that profound existential feeling of alienation. David does not want to die and foregoes or follows desire depending on which allows survival. Craig is willing to accept physical annihilation if it means he can still desire and be desired. Maxine loses humanity in favor of the material aspects of life. Lottie does not choose eternal life in Malkovich and instead keeps her mortality to be with Maxine and her daughter. And the short-sighted woman's devotion leaves her waiting in a diner, uncertain if it will lead to anything more physical or permanent than her own blindness. Within their snares, they all make choices to cope with, escape, or love in spite of what awaits them. And unlike lobsters, they won't live for a hundred years, but like chimps, they may surrender to the human beings around them who try to control the world. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you made it to the end, that's awesome. This video literally made me question my entire career path in film criticism. It was really daunting to tackle so much philosophy and not to sound stupid and sound original. And I did my best and I hope it was good. Um, I have my Substack and my website linked in the bio. Definitely check those out. And thank you guys so much.